is working with uh, uh, Pierre, uh, Patrice, and uh, myself. So he, he will talk about uh, probabilistic forecasting of heat waves with uh, uh, deep learning. Okay. Uh, so I'll just use this. No, that doesn't work. Uh, which one am I supposed to? Play the slide. Ah, ok. On va dire, mais pour un slide, ça ne marche pas. Ouais. Je vais brancher le truc. Ah, ouais, ça fait. Je vais brancher la petite clé. <rire> ah, d'accord. OSB. Ah, Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you fail, skip it will work even it will work okay yeah. will work okay, okay. <laughs> yes it will work okay <clears throat> thanks for the introduction um so as stated uh, I'm going to talk about uh, probabilistic forecasting of heat waves uh, with uh, machine learning. Uh, so uh, machine learning uh, has been already applied for um, forecasting heat waves. Uh, for example, in, oops, sorry. Yes, uh, in this work, uh, but we wanted to make uh, probabilistic forecasting and here's a, another example of uh, using a methodology developed for object classification and applying it uh, for, um, uh, for, class, for, for finding extreme events. Uh, in this case, these are tropical cyclones down here. Okay, so I'm going to very quickly jump through the introduction to machine learning and then how it is used in computational earth sciences. Uh, and then I will talk about uh, my work uh, in this group and about our future work. Okay, so as you know, machine learning consists of uh, various fields. We will be interested in this talk in supervised learning. Uh, and uh, well, you've seen these images very often. So this is a feed forward neural network. You have to optimize cost function uh, by using a back propagation algorithm. Uh, to, uh, to optimize the weights, basically. Uh, okay, so how is this used in, what, what does this have to do with uh, computational earth sciences? So uh, historically, pattern recognition was used as the main method for, for, uh, for meteorological forecasting. Um, and that's how the method of analogs was developed. But uh, of course, with the development of uh, numerical weather prediction, uh, we started relying more on um, physical models. Uh, however, we are observing that uh, as uh, our need for more precise models uh, increases, uh, we need uh, finer grids, uh, we need better parameterizations. And so um, the problem is that uh, uh, the, the more scaling, or in this case, the energy scaling, uh, which refers to the uh, arithmetic speed of computers, it is leveling off. And uh, so uh, we are looking for other ways to um, somehow extract information uh, without having to run very, very complex models or finding shortcuts. Uh, so uh, machine learning has shown uh, its success in prediction of uh, uh, events such as El Nino Southern Oscillation, in the long term, so here you see uh, here you see the index of El Nino as a function of uh, years, uh, and black is observation, and this is a convolutional neural network prediction, and this is the model, and so you can see that it's working relatively well. Um, also, the method of analogs uh, 
may work well in, in, in these situations. Uh, okay, so uh, in, in this work, uh, we were interested in working with uh, uh, general circulation models to uh, predict extreme heat waves. So this is the uh, extreme heat wave that happened in uh, Europe in 2003. Uh, this is the temperature uh, plotted here. Unfortunately, you cannot read this, but this goes from minus 10 to 10. So this is a, a monthly mean. So it's a pretty high uh, anomaly. Uh, so it cannot be attributed to uh, climate change completely, uh, but um, questions like this are being asked. So for example, uh, people wonder, uh, with continual climate change, uh, given that the distribution of, uh, of, the, of the events are shifting um, and also the variance may change, uh, they wonder how, what will be the frequency of heat waves, for example. So this is another question that is, that is important to address. And it's difficult to address because how rare heat waves are. So in order to collect good statistics, you have to run climate models for a very long time. So this is complicated. Okay, so well, let's move to our work. Or yeah, actually, uh, before we move to our work, uh, let's talk a little bit about heat waves. So this is an example of Scandinavian uh, blocking uh, event in 2018. So here you have a map of uh, um, geopotential and temperature superimposed on each other. So temperature is blue uh, to red again. And uh, this is geopotential. So geopotential is geopotential at 500 millibars, uh, which is typically used for forecasting. Um, it is a pressure uh, basically for physicists. Uh, and uh, as you know, a quasi-geostrophic flow, it sort of flows um, parallel to, uh, um, to the geopotential. So here you could say that there is a direction coming from the south. And uh, in general, when you, uh, this is not necessarily true for heat waves in Scandinavia. In fact, it's not true for heat waves in Scandinavia, but in general, uh, heat waves may uh, also be uh, caused by dry soil. So if you have dry soil, you're more likely going to have uh, a heat wave because uh, there aren't, uh, there's not enough evaporation. Okay, so this, this particular event here in Scandinavia, uh, this is uh, the time series for the uh, area integral over the um, over this, this area of Scandinavia. Uh, so here in blue, you see the time series. And in July, it sort of peaks and it's, uh, it's above uh, the norm for a very long time. And in orange, I plotted the running mean. So here I plotted the 30 day running mean. Um, which means that you're, you're integrating forward in time. So it starts to increase before an actual event, of course. Uh, and it's quite large, so it's uh, about three degrees uh, for, for 30 days. Okay, so, oops, go back. Okay, so uh, what is the definition that we will use for a heat wave? We will use the simple definition, uh, which is, uh, so you take the area that you are interested in. So in, in this case, it will be the area of France because we are in France, for example. And uh, um, T is the temp two meter temperature, which is relevant for humans. Uh, and uh, this is the average. So basically we're looking at the anomaly. Um, and um, you integrate this also in time. This is the running mean. It will be the 14 days because we will look for at 14 day events. Uh, this corresponds to um, in our climate model uh, where, where we, had a we, we had a simulation uh, with the climate model and I'm gonna talk about a bit later. This, these are like the superimposed time series and uh, we are looking at the extreme. So in other words, if you were to, uh, to make a histogram, we're looking at the extreme here. Okay, so the model that we're, going, we're using uh, is um, uh, called PLASM, Planet Simulator. Uh, and it's a model that sometimes appears in the IPCC reports. Uh, at least the, I mean, it's, it's in the intermediate complexity model. Uh, so it, uh, it has the resolution that you can see basically here, I'm, I'm plotting the grid 
uh, on top of the uh, map of the Earth. So the resolution is uh, about three degrees by three degrees. It's quite coarse, so 100 kilometers. Um, but it allows us to uh, simulate this for this model for 8,000 years, which is a lot. So it gives us a lot of statistics. So here I'm plotting uh, the analysis of uh, uh, the frequency. This is something that uh, one may care about if one wants to make predictions about uh, uh, what is the return time, for example, of certain heat waves. Here I'm plotting the, uh, uh, the temperature anomaly. Uh, and here I'm plotting the number of years you have to wait for this anomaly to happen. And in this orange, uh, curve that you should, uh, field line that you should uh, uh, concentrate on. Um, uh, uh, this, is, this is the one that we get from uh, PLASM. So what this, what this graph shows us is that in, if you wait 10 years, then you will have a four degree uh, heat wave. Uh, okay, uh, in yearly heat wave will be four degrees. And uh, these dotted lines are, the dotted points are uh, reanalysis. So reanalysis is, uh, is the database uh, that uh, is based on data assimilation from the observations. And so it shows you, uh, it actually surprisingly well matches this model, even though it's so uh, simple. This I mean, it's not actually the simplest model. You can have more simple models, but uh, it's not as complex as some other models that uh, are more costly. Okay, so uh, what are we interested in? We're interested in finding the probability, the conditional probability uh, of detecting a heat wave. Uh, so given some condition X, okay, so um, uh, meteorologists use different uh, kinds of scores and the score that we find most adapted for our purposes is a logarithmic score. Uh, and in machine learning is known as cross entropy, is related to cross entropy. Um, and the reason we choose it is because it's suitable for rare events. So it's because of the logarithmic dependence here, it is sensitive to uh, small probabilities. So here I'm writing it in general for the multi-class classification. Um, and the K will be two for us because we're doing binary classification. In uh, the limit of large data set, you can represent this of course, as uh, Shannon's entropy and uh, kublet libel divergence, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to approximate the true probability with the probability that the, the, the neural network serves us with. And the scale score that we will be reporting, this is the important point, uh, we call it normalized scale score. And uh, here, basically, the thing is that you want to make sure that uh, the value that you get uh, from the logarithmic score, it has to be compared uh, with a very simple prediction that is just climatology. In other words, uh, knowing, for example, what is uh, on average the number of heat waves uh, at, at this point, you could already make a prediction. For example, the probability is 5% a priori. You could already assign this uh, as a prediction and uh, basically we want to beat this. So uh, this score is defined, uh, designed in such a way that if it is one, then it's a perfect prediction, which is not possible. If it is zero, then it's as good as climatology, which means it's not, it's not good. And it can be less. So it's uh, for a very bad prediction. Okay, so now, uh, yeah. So for, for a probabilistic prediction, what one uses in neural networks often is a soft max. Uh, which makes sure that your, um, the output of a neural network is in a range from zero to one. Uh, so this is a plot of a sigmoid uh, for binary classification. Uh, even though I'm doing binary classification, I'm still relying on the apparatus that can be easily generalized to multi-class classification. Uh, in this case, it's called softmax. Uh, so uh, the label one will correspond to a heat wave. The label zero will correspond to not heat wave. And uh, the way we will define a heat wave here is also quite simple. It's just the 95th percentile of, so like the largest 5% of A, A that was this, the defined earlier, which is the 14 day running mean of temperature <clears throat> integrated over the area of France. Uh, so our input will consist of um, 
uh, in general of three fields. So the two meter temperature, so predicting temperature with temperature, the um, 500 mill millibar geopotential, which is, uh, has more global information that's encoded in it. And therefore we are using the whole field about 30 degrees north uh, uh, in the North hemisphere, which is relevant for heat waves in France. And uh, we are also going to rely on soil moisture because again, as I mentioned earlier, this is an important parameter. Okay, so uh, then you do the standard uh, K-fold class, uh, K-fold uh, um, uh, cross validation. Um, and okay, let me move this. We do this in order to um, be able to say what's the uncertainty of our score. Um, and this is the architecture. So we are using a, a convolutional neural network um, because you know this way you have fewer neurons uh, to worry about. And um, for in general, for us, actually, the fact that it's translationally invariant may not be the best su suitable choice, but uh, it allows us to uh, have fewer neurons, I would say. Uh, okay, so this is the input. You put it through a convolution, uh, through a max pool filter, through a convolution max pool, and uh, then through a soft max after you flatten it. So this is pretty uh, standard. And uh, so, okay, so here we present uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, normalized skill score as a function of tau. Yeah, uh, uh, as a function of tau. Uh, versus uh, different combi combinations of fields, because now that we can decide what to put, put inside our neural network, we can see how well these fields perform. And this way we will know, or at least we will we'll find what, uh, what matters for the neural network to make the prediction. So the best combination is of course, to take all three of them. And in this case, uh, when tau is equal to zero, which means I think I have not defined it in words, it was on the slide, but tau is the lag time before the, uh, from the, uh, for the heat wave and the data that the neural network sees. Okay, so, um, so when tau is equal to zero, then uh, we get um, this score. This is um, a number from zero to one. So it's much less than one, but it's also larger than zero. Uh, it's not easy to predict a heat wave at tau equals zero simply because uh, we, are, uh, we are trying to predict um, 14 days ahead of time. So we're trying to predict uh, the running mean that is 14 days long. So of course you will not get a scale of one. Okay, and then of course it deteriorates and it deteriorates as, as the tau increases uh, up to one month. Um, and uh, well, you might ask, okay, so why does it flatten like this? And uh, so what we did is, as I said, we are looking at different combinations. So the different combinations uh, include uh, just taking geopotential, which is CG and uh, for example, soil moisture. And this is uh, essentially equivalent to our best uh, combination. So in other words, temperature doesn't play a big role here. Um, and then we have this orange curve, which is uh, the uh, temperature and soil moisture. And you start to see that soil moisture plays a big role. So soil moisture plays a big role in a long-term prediction and it does not deteriorate very much. Um, okay, so this is our like one conclusion and, and the, the, the global geopotential uh, gives you uh, information uh, early on. Okay, so let's move on. So another thing that's important to check is uh, how much data do you need in order to make a prediction? So uh, we have a lot of data, we have 8,000 years, but uh, oftentimes, uh, what people do in practice is they use the analysis, which means you only have up to 70 years of reliable data. And so that's not a lot. Um, so we also performed a data reduction uh, study where we were looking at uh, subsets. So, so there are two, basically here you see four lines, but they correspond to uh, uh, two things that we're changing. So we're changing uh, the number of uh, years that we use in order to perform the training. And we are changing uh, what kind of information we provide the neural network. Uh, so the information is uh, limited to either like full information 
or just the North Atlantic? Because we expect the North Atlantic to play a big role in the, in the prediction. Uh, but we also hope to extract some extra information uh, from, uh, uh, from, from uh, outside region. So these are often called uh, teleconnection patterns. Um, so what we see is that, so of course, when you have less data, this is these two curves, you're going to perform worse, okay? So um, in fact, uh, what you are seeing here, because it's 800 years is even worse than in the previous slide. So in the previous slide, there was 7,200 years. Um, here you have 800 years, this is the reduction, and then we go to this. Uh, but the, the observation that's interesting is that uh, when, you, um, when you go to as low as 100 years, then you see that this red curve, uh, which uh, corresponds to the training performed on the North Atlantic region, uh, actually outperforms the training that uh, was performed on the uh, global region, uh, which is contrary to what happens when you have um, even 800 years. So the amount of data matters. This makes sense, but I guess having sort of a, a more accurate estimation about how much data you need in order to be able to extract information that's global is uh, perhaps interesting to keep in mind. Uh, okay, so I'm going to the next slide. So we also want to know what the, the neural network looks at when it makes a prediction. Um, uh, normally, well, well, basically currently, we have a PhD student who is working on uh, figuring this out using saliency maps, this is Alessandro. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so we are very interested in that. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, I will only show you the composite maps. So composite maps means that I'm taking the mean um, and I'm conditioning it in this case to the, uh, uh, to the only to the data which uh, the network thought were heat waves with a very high probability. Um, so this is a really high probability. Um, and I'm doing this for um, a set of tau. So in other words, this is tau. Tau equals zero means that's when the heat wave starts. And uh, so when you perform this composite, you see this kind of a, uh, here unfortunately don't have a color map, but it's, you cannot see well the uh, numbers, but uh, each level, this is levels of geopotential, the, they are 20 meters. Uh, if you're wondering, and this is positive and this is negative, the fact that this is positive makes sense because the heat wave is going to uh, be correlated with uh, a positive anomaly of geopotential because I'm looking at summer. This is another thing which I forgot to mention, I think. Um, and, um, uh, and here you have uh, the uh, negative. Um, um, anomaly, and so we have this kind of a triple structure that it, that it, that uh, corresponds to those those um, uh, those um, data points which were ranked as a heat wave correct, correct correctly. Um, then um, here um, here we have tau equals minus five, which means we're five days ahead, and here we have tau equals minus ten. And what you see is that this uh, pattern shifts a little bit. Um, yeah, so surprisingly, we don't see, uh, for instance, uh, uh, we don't see this anticyclone move here, uh, but we see some kind of shift um, towards the other two nodes of, of this tripole. And we also see a shift that is here. So we haven't really fully understood this yet, but this is, a, this is an observation. But I think that really interesting things will come out of the saliency map because um, uh, when you do a saliency map, then you, you can uh, measure uh, using your neural network uh, where the gradient is largest. And this way you can sort of see what's important in your image uh, for making the classification. Okay, so the future work uh, that could be interesting in this group uh, is uh, applying uh, this neural network to the rare event algorithm. So rare event algorithm, there are different versions of rare event algorithm. But uh, this is the one that is likely to be used. It's a genealogical rare event algorithm, um, simply because we are trying to predict uh, events which are time dependent. Uh, and uh, uh, if you know the commuter function in advance, uh, sorry, I didn't define commuter function. This is a conditional probability for us. If you already know the, if you have an estimate of the conditional probability, 
uh, of the heat wave, you can use this information for your genealogical rare event algorithm because you could uh, then uh, basically trim your uh, runs. So you could choose the simulations which have the characteristics that are likely to be heat waves. And this way you can do the important sampling. So you can shift the, the probability of uh, events, which uh, uh, normally this would be a very rare event, for example, it becomes a relatively common effect, common uh, event. And from uh, other analysis that I have done, it's obvious that if you don't have enough heat waves, it's, it's difficult to also make predictions about them and it's difficult to study them. Um, so it's, it's the heat wave events that are particularly important for, for the prediction and not so much the not heat wave events. Uh, okay, so uh, in my work, uh, I've, uh, when I was doing this training, I've noticed that uh, when uh, you train uh, independently, uh, the, this neural network for each value of tau, uh, then what happens is that uh, it, as a function of tau, you might get something which is not uh, smooth. Uh, and uh, this could be caused by the fact that um, uh, your neural network gets trapped in some local um, minima uh, because you're optimizing independently. Uh, and so then uh, uh, what was obvious to do was to do transfer learning. So it's also faster to train like this. So you initialize uh, maybe from randomly the, uh, the first uh, one, which corresponds to tau equals zero, and then you have to train uh, the next day, uh, but you do the transfer learning from the previous day. Uh, we try to do fine tuning and other techniques, but it seems to be that it doesn't matter. Like uh, if you just transfer learn, it's the most optimal way. Um, and then you get this blue curve, which is uh, more smooth. So, so you have to think of like tau equals zero is when the heat wave starts. And this particular event I've chosen in my favor because it's the one where the heat wave, where, where the neural network correctly guesses that this is a, a heat wave. Um, and uh, you would like um, uh, for, for this uh, probability to increase as you get closer and closer to the uh, to the event, and in this case, the time is running backwards. Because larger tau means we are backwards in time. Okay, so uh, another things that I'm working on is uh, yeah uh, that I worked on is the analog method. So this is sort of going back to pattern recognition in some ways, but it's a little bit more complicated because this is a Markov chain where uh, if we are in the feature space. Um, and these are other sort of, uh, so, okay, so, e so we take the data, uh, the, the data is X, and uh, the data may have analogs close to it, and uh, we try to construct synthetic trajectories uh, based on, uh, on the data that we already made, so this 8,000 years of simulation, for example, and uh, this was work uh, done by Dario, and uh, mm, Dario found Dario and me. We found that it's not so easy to uh, uh, apply this method for predicting heat waves. Or you can do this, but you get a skill that's worse than with a neural network, and uh, you cannot really extract the global information. And we think it sort of makes sense because if you the global information that is stored in Joe Potential, it's uh, very high dimensional. So then one possibility is to perform. Um, various kinds of uh, dimensionality reductions, and typically in machine learning, the uh, people often use uh, you know some version of autoencoder. Um, yeah, there are, there are many ways to do that. So this is something that we are working on. Uh, and then, of course, what would be interesting to do of, uh, would be to use uh, the ways that we trained on on intermediate complexity model. And we also have data available to us, which uh, from, from a CSM, which is a, a high complexity climate model. And we would like to apply, so do the transfer learning to there. And this way we would benefit from a large data pool of plasm and uh, the more sort of fidelity of CSM. And then perhaps uh, also do, do this uh, next step to reanalysis. Okay, so, um, yeah, so this is uh, this is my talk, uh, and thanks for all my collaborators.